It's time for a Drummer Nation. Joe LaBarbera hails from a musical family. The siblings Pat and John are also mainstays on the jazz scene. Joe was formally educated at the Berklee College of Music where he was noticed by Chuck Mangione and Woody Herman. The subsequent move to New York led to work with established jazz headliners Jim Hall, Phil Woods, and Gary Burton. In 1978, Joe joined the great Bill Evans trio and remained until Evans' death. He now lives in LA where he has been teaching at Cal Arts since 1993. Sound Synergy's Procussion Care Lubricants and Conditioners include a series of three products for total drum kit care and maintenance. Procussion Care products in your gig bag ensures your entire kit will always look and sound its best. Check out their website at soundsynergies.net. I absolutely love playing drums and I couldn't imagine uh, not having that in my life. And I really, uh, if I could fac help facilitate that and have an impact on your life so that you can play drums, that means the world to me. Drummers seeking a quick and easy way to muffle bass drums on the fly, look no further. Muffbone offers an effective way to instantly dial in your sound in just a few seconds while seated at the kit. Find out more at muffbone.com. When seated at the drums, pressure on the tailbone, lower back, and hip joints can lead to pain. Only Carmichael drum thrones are scientifically designed to relieve and prevent discomforts associated with prolonged sitting. Carmichael thrones, we got your back. Created specifically for practice sessions, Quiet Tone Practice Cymbals by Sabian are designed to respond and feel like traditional cymbals, right down to their clearly defined bell, so the drummers won't have to change the way they play. Quiet Tone Practice Cymbals by Sabian. Osha means a good time. There's lots of music, lots of friends, and lots of love. Hi, this is Stanton Moore. I've been playing and teaching drums for over 30 years. My new site, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, is the perfect online drum learning platform for any level drummer to learn how to play the drums the same way I did. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you as subscribers on the site, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Joe LaBarbera, my friend, great to see you again. Welcome to the show, and thanks for doing it. How are you? I'm fine, Michael. Pleasure to be here. Well, I've always been a big fan of your playing. The first time I heard you play was in the early 70s, oddly enough, with Chuck Mangione. And you sent it great on that band. I love that band, Michael. I mean, that was, that was for me, you know, in the early 70s, there weren't a lot of opportunities for, for, for me to get out and play in a small group. There were plenty of big bands to go and play with, but for a lot of the young guys, there weren't a lot of small bands. And Chuck I'd been a fan of since I was you know, in, in high school and w saw all his great bebop bands. And then he started to move slowly into a more fusion um, element. And I was happy to be a part of that music with great musicians all the way. Oh, it's a great band. It's a great band. But let's back up. You're from a musical family. I know you have two brothers who are musicians, uh, Pat and John. Yes. Tell me about them. Where do you stand in the, in the age order there? I'm the youngest of the three. You know, my father um, was a musician by avocation. He always had a, 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 a day job to, you know, put food on the table, but he worked, he worked a lot of musical jobs. Even before he was married, he had bands, park bands, dance bands, you name it. Uh, we, were, we were born into a home full of instruments and music, and we were exposed to a wide variety of music, everything from, um, you know, a traditional uh, Italian folk music to Duke Ellington and Fletcher Henderson and Glenn Miller and so on. So uh, we grew up playing all of that. So you play, you play other instruments as well? My father started me out on the drums when I was five, I believe, maybe six. And then a couple of years later, when my embouchure developed, he started me on clarinet and saxophone, which I actually played through high school uh, in the in the marching band and in the, in, in the stage band, they called it dance band, whatever, um, and uh, and then let, left that aside and went on to college for drums, Berkeley College. And and uh, who were your early influences as a kid listening to drummers? In, uh, well, the first drummer I, I remember hearing um, that I was aware of was probably Papa Joe Jones. 
Uh, Pat was bringing home some Lester Young records, and Papa Joe was on that stuff. I also remember hearing some Kenny Clark early on, and then uh, I was fortunate enough as uh, as a young kid at the age of, uh, I think, seven, Gene Krupa came to my hometown and played in a little club in my hometown for a week, mm. and my father... My father brought me by there on the after, Sunday afternoon matinee and put me up on his shoulders, and uh, I got to look at Gene wailing away. I don't have much more of a, of a image or a memory of that event, but I do remember the drums were making a big impact on me at that time. Uh, of all the legends I've seen, I never had the opportunity to see Gene. I sure wish I would have. Um, he's kind of the, one of the great fathers of us all. Um, so tell us about your brothers, for the guys who don't know. Who do, what are their names and what do they play? I think what our symbols uh, brought to the Sabian uh, family is that there is more, lots more hand hammering. They're all hand hammered, and so you really have to perfect the hammering technique and where to hammer on the symbol. You know, you don't want to get the symbol too thin in a lot of places. They were willing to try it, and I think we came out with with a great product that uh, that is a great musical instrument. My brother, my oldest brother Pat, is a uh, woodwind player. He plays tenor, soprano, he plays all the woodwinds basically. But tenor is his axe, tenor and soprano. And he played with Buddy Rich's band for, I think it was seven or eight years, maybe ten. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure, but for a long time. And when he left Buddy, he got the call from Elvin Jones and worked with Elvin for an equal amount of time. And in fact, went back. Uh, quite often when Elvin was in a, in a tight spot and needed somebody to fill in, Pat was always going out to help Jones out. So uh, I, I saw him with Elvin in the uh, 80s in Los Angeles, and he, he was just so, great. So through my brother Pat, I was exposed to and met um, two of the greatest drummers, I think, of all time, You know, and, and got to know them both quite well over the years. Now, um, your other brother's a writer, a piano player? My middle brother, John, started out on the coronet. See, we had what was considered to be, I would say, a traditional, like, New Orleans-style uh, New Orleans style band, because I played the drums. Mm -hmm. uh, my father played the piano or the accordion, depending on the, uh, the setup. Uh, Pat played the clarinet and the saxophone. John played the coronet. And eventually, my mother joined us on, on string bass, and we played uh, in that style. I mean, I grew up playing kind of like like Baby Dodds, my oh, father. Yeah, I, I mean, I started playing time on the snare drum. That's what was written on the parts, you know? You, that's what I was looking at, so that's what I was playing for, mm -hmm. for a number of years. And then eventually I uh, started to transfer it over to a, the hi-hat and, uh, and then to a, a little uh, ride cymbal. The parts back then, as I recall, would be like uh, every bar had four quarter notes with rolls tied one to the next. Exactly right. <laughs> and uh, that that was your time source. It was really just a guide as to where the band was. Yeah. Uh, and then you would improvise. Now, uh, your brother wrote for the Buddy's band, right? John wrote for all the bands. Right. I mean, he, every every band out there, he wrote. He started out with the Glenn Miller band, wrote for that band. Then he joined Buddy's band. In 1968, we all were together with Buddy's band in Las Vegas for a month. I was working with Frankie Randall, a wonderful uh, Sinatra-style singer, great musician, Juilliard mm -hmm. graduate, very capable pianist, but fine singer. And we worked a month at the Sands with Buddy's band, so that's when I got to really know Buddy, because I'm playing his drums every night for Frankie's show with the band. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then I'm watching him, and we're hanging out, and uh, I got to rehearse a bunch of the charts that month. But John was hired in that month, uh, he came in as a fourth trumpet player. And now, I've heard this story, I don't know if it's true, that, you know, Buddy didn't read, and your mm -hmm. brother was a writer. Did you often play and read the read the stuff the first few time or two for Buddy to hear it? Yeah, but not John's charts, because he wasn't writing yet. Uh, that month in January of 68, he got uh, Channel One Suite mm. and B Big Mama Cass, and I think Mercy Mercy, I can't remember exactly, but there were a few that came in that month. And the band's in a location, so Buddy calls a rehearsal, and he sees me, says, hey, kid, you know, get up there, play the drums, let me hear this thing, you know. So, yeah, we, I rehearsed the band for him and uh, struggled my way through everything because I couldn't read very well back then myself, you know, but at least I, I had a, an idea what to do. And, and then he had, like, a, uh, 
whatever you would call a photographic memory for ears, aura, aurographic, I guess. He, he would memorize the charts right away, and then he had it, right? And never forget them. You know, years later, he'd call a chart up that he hadn't played in years, and, and he would remember everything about the music, whereas the guys that were reading it were, you know, doing their best, and they were all top-flight players. But, yeah, he just had an uncanny ability to to process music. And I think Roy Haynes has the same uh, ability because he doesn't read music either, I'm told, and he learns it by, by ear, but then he's got it. Yeah, one of the many, many ways Buddy is was so amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the many ways. Now, you went to Berkeley School of Music? Mm -hmm. Study with Alan Dawson, John Laporta, Phil Wilson. I didn't actually have classes with Herb Pomeroy, but he was a huge inspiration. Uh, just, you know, he's one of those guys you just wanted to play well for. Charlie Mariano I had for, for an ensemble. Uh, who am I forgetting? Jimmy Mosher I had for an ensemble. Top flight faculty. Just oh, Fred uh, Buddha, Freddie Buddha. Always was, oh. still is a great faculty. Yes. Now, yeah, did, yeah. You, did you finish with a degree there? No, I did not. I ended up leaving and going out on the road. And uh, Who'd you go out with? I went out with Frankie. Frankie. Oh, all right, all right, all right. And then eventually did Woody's band, right? Yes. Uh, got drafted um, about a year after Berkeley. Did a couple of years for Uncle Sam. And then uh, when I came out of the Army, I was working with uh, Gap Man Johnny, Chuck's older brother, in a trio in Rochester. And I got the call from Woody's band and went out with them. Now, had your reading improved considerably by then? Because that's a, that's a reading gig. Well, it isn't. <laughs> that's ironically you know jeff hamilton and i always I always love to talk about this because we 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 knew that book by heart before we even showed up right mm -hmm. you you do the homework i knew all of you know all of the arrangements well, let's stop I right knew. there most kids need to hear that twice you do the homework before you show up so oh, you yeah. know the music yes there's there's a famous story with wayne shorter's first night with miles davis was at the hollywood bowl and um Miles says in the dressing room, you know my music? He said, yeah. He said, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and they walked out playing walking, I think. But, but for kids watching, take note of that, man. You, you, don't, you learn the book before you show up. Yeah, this is a little something that uh, Jeff that stresses, and I, I agree with this. When you take a student on and you say, well, you know, who do you want to play with? And the kid will say, you know, Cyrus Chestnut, you know, for example. And so Jeff will say, well, do you know the music? And the kid will say, no, well, you better start learning it because that's how it works, you know. When I went into Bill Evans' audition, even though I hadn't heard his trio in a number of years, I grew up listening to that trio. And so mm -hmm. I knew all of the early arrangements, which he was still doing. And then intuitively I was able to follow him because I was tuned into that group. So it is important. Yeah, not only the band, but the whole style, the whole idiom, their peers, their contemporaries, you have to do your own work. You do, and eventually Woody told me later on, you know, when we talked about it, because I could read, you know, and I had to read, but uh, he said, you know, I don't care if my drummers can read. He said, I, I know they're going to learn the book. What right. I need them to do is get a feel for the band and, and keep the band together and make it swing. Well, that goes to the uh, gig number one for any drummer on any band in any style is to make the band sound good, right? Yes. And if you put listening ahead of everything else, it should work out if you do your homework. That's where the homework comes in. Hey, everybody out there in cyber world, this is Adam Nussbaum. Hi, Dave DeCenso here. Hi, Bermuda Schwartz here. Hey, everyone, Stanton Moore here. Hey, guys, John Tempesta here. Hey, everybody, this is John J.R. Robinson. Hi, Todd Zuckerman here for the Drum Center of Portsmouth. They're knowledgeable, they'll be able to help you and guide you and make the right choices for you and the music that you play. From wingnut to Wuhan, these chaps know what they're talking about. Highly recommended. But what do I know? I'm a drummer. All of us guys uh, got together at PASIC about, I don't know, 15 years ago. I was there. And, oh yeah, for the, for the wood, drums of Woody Herman. So, we're all saying, you know, Jake, we learned all we learned all the charts by listening to you. And his reply was, "Oh, so you know my fill? You know, like, <laughs> he's, like, he's, like he's only got one. He's only know? got one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I miss Jake. He was he was a gem. Oh my God, funny as hell. There's mm -hmm. so many characters that we don't have around anymore, like Jake, like Freddie Gruber, like uh, Jim Chapin, yeah. Lenny DiMuzio. You Lenny, know, oh my God, these yeah. guys were characters, man.
And, Truly. Uh, we sure do miss them. We sure do miss yeah. them. Yeah. Um, so what did you learn from Woody's band? What was the key thing you learned when you got... You show up to the band, they don't know who you are, you got you to gotta impress, you got to cover the gig. What, what lessons came to mind? Well, I actually learned how to, you know, play. I played in, a, in big band ensembles at Berkeley, but you don't really grow, at least I didn't grow with a band until I was working with it every night. Mm-hmm. Now you're, you're, you're picking up all the little nuances, and you're understanding that the, the saxes are going to lay back on the time, especially in that band, because Woody's lead style, lead alto style, was patterned after Johnny Hodges, so they're, mm-hmm. they're pulling back on the time a little bit. The trumpets are on the, on the on the edge, they're pushing it ahead a little bit. You learn these things, and you learn how to how to put that beat directly in the center so that it helps everybody. That's that was one thing in terms of a practical nature with the band, you know. Also, you learn very quickly what you need in terms of gear, because I showed up with my little eighteen. No, I, no actually, I had a twenty-inch uh, bass drum, which probably was adequate, mm. but uh, you know, I just didn't have enough. I needed a, a couple of crash cymbals. I needed more. Th- more uh, options for for uh, for sound with that band, and it was it, that was another lesson. But the main thing I learned from Woody was patience, because for sure he had to be patient with all of us young upstarts who thought we knew everything. Right. And and I also learned how to pace a set of music, how to how to program what follows what, you know, how to make the evening enjoyable for the audience and for the players. You also had to handle some serious tempos, just Caldonia alone. Uh, yeah. For those who know, don't know, um, Caledonia was kind of a novelty tune, but Woody had a great arrangement of it, faster than living hell, and it featured everybody in the band. So it's you true. were back there comping for every soloist, and then there's a drum solo. Yeah. So uh, how did you, um, do you have any tips for playing those kind of tempos? Some guys like maybe think of it in halftime or... No, actually, honestly, Michael, I, I learned by playing along with all the records. You mm-hmm. know, I, I would have a Saturday morning regimen of all my fast tempo stuff, you know, Miles walking from uh, Miles in Europe, Woody Caldonia or Apple Honey, you know, Dizzy Gillespie with Stan Getz and Max Roach playing It Don't Mean a Thing. There's a mm-hmm. whole, a whole, mm-hmm. and they're, they're not only fast, they're long tracks. Right. And so I had to, I had to just work it out, just physically train myself to be able to deal with it, stay relaxed and and to be able to hang and you know i think by the time by the time i was out of high school I actually could play fast tempos pretty easily without too much sweat but uh, you know of course that's one thing to play along with a record player and another thing to play along with the 16 guys that all have you know they've all got their own ideas about where the time's supposed to be yeah. so <laughs> and you're you're driving you're driving the bus too yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you get the credit and the blame um when did you move to new york after what he's been well, and after Woody's band, and, and I got the call from Chuck, actually while I was with Woody, so I left Woody mm-hmm. to go with Chuck. Uh, and then uh, during my last year with Chuck, I decided to uh, move to New York City. And that's when I left Chuck and just st- went into New York and and started to, you know, see what, if, if it would work for me. Well, it certainly did. I have a few uh, New York years working with Phil Woods, Art Farmer, Art Pepper, Gary Burton, all kinds of great jazz artists. I get that. That's what that was another education in itself. I presume, first year in New totally. York. Yeah. What 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 do you remember from learning from that? Let's say your first year in the city. You know, you get there and the energy is overwhelming, but you get swept up in it and you start to go around and hear people, and you're hearing the best players there are. You know, so now you're figuring out where you stand amongst all of these players. And there are great players that you don't even know yet, you haven't mm-hmm. even heard of, and there mm-hmm. they are, you know. So you, you start to, you gotta work, man. I mean, it's 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 either gonna uh, give you an incentive to grow or it's gonna scare the hell out of you and you're gonna leave town. So fortunately, I decided to stick it out. And uh, my good friend, Bill Goodwin, came through with uh, a job for me. He had to sub out with Jim Hall and Michael Moore for a week at Sweet Basil which exposed me to basically everybody in town because they were all coming by to hear Jim. And, and as a consequence, they heard me, and a lot of them liked what they heard, and I started getting calls for work. Hamilton talks about being with Monty Alexander, and he looks up in the audience, and there's like 
I don't remember exactly, Philly Joe Jones, and uh, I mean, it was like three or four great drummers in there. That's what happens in New York. What uh, the first time that happens is it flip you out when you're, you're on the bandstand and it's full of legends, three or four guys in the audience that are legendary? I'm sure it does. You know, it actually happened with me with Chuck. We played the Village Vanguard for a week, and one night I looked at the bar and there was Alphonse Muzan, Tony Williams, and Billy Hart, you know? <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, <laughs> but just a couple of guys. Is, you know what? They were all cool, and I mean, Billy and I are still buds, man, to this day. And, uh, drummers tend to love each. Drummers tend to love each other, don't you think? I think so. I think yeah, so. We've all been in that hot seat, and you get a lot of the blame. And you put ten great drummers on a band, and the leader's gonna like somebody better than somebody else. And you know, we all kind of know that routine and help each other. Uh, my career has been on a local level, but those same things still apply. I think yeah, it's true. Sound Synergies Percussion Care Lubricants and Conditioners include a series of three products for total drum kit care and maintenance. Pedal Lube, the only product specifically designed for bass drum, hi-hat pedals and triggers, as well as all moving metal parts and drum hardware, safely removes grit, grime and other contaminants while protecting against harmful friction wear. Cymbal Care, restores and conditions cymbal surfaces without strippers or harmful polishes. Wear Barrier is a conditioning formula for all drum heads, rims and even sticks. Procussion Care products in your gig bag ensures your entire kit will always look and sound its best. Now, your work with Bill Evans is very notable. Bill is noted to have three great trios in his life, the first being with uh, Paul Motion and Scott LaFaro, right, in the 60s. In the 70s, it would have been with um, 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 Eddie Gomez Marty and, and Marty Morell. And, yeah. and then you and Mark Johnson in the 80s. Those are pretty serious shoes to fill, just like with Woody's band. Um, and that's quite a different thing, playing, I mean, Bill Evans was the ultimate in sophistication and style and nuance and, and, and understated beauty. That's quite a different thing than driving a big band. Yeah, it is, but in fact, there, was a, there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that carried over from the big band to the small group. First of all, you, you gauge your, your volume accordingly. That's number one. Okay? Mm -hmm. But then the fact that Woody's band had arrangements... With, with hits that I had to make. Bill's trio had arrangements with hits I had to make, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, it was the, it was, it was similar in that you, you played the arrangement, then there was the improvisation, and then you take the, the tune out. Those things were similar. Then beyond that, of course, there was, there were extremes in the, uh, in the dynamics. So for example, with Bill, I could play like at a whisper with a with a brush on a cymbal, just a little roll, and it would be not only audible, but it would it would be felt within the trio. So things like that, of course, you can't do in a big band very well. But you know, Bill came up through the big bands as well. You know, he did a uh, he did a year with Herbie Fields band. Now, if you're not familiar with Herbie Fields, it was a band that was around in the '40s and '50s patterned quite a bit after like Lionel Hampton. So it was a jump band, you know. So the arrangements were hot and hard and Bill used to say, man, I split my fingernails every night, but he loved every minute of it because it was an experience to be out playing with professionals. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the fact that he, he came from a similar background musically that Mark and I did, because Mark was on Woody's band as well. You oh, know? Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, I, all I can say is that uh, working with Woody was a help and not a hindrance in terms of playing with with Bill Evans' trio. Now let's talk about your sound. You uh, you play Gretsch drums your whole life, right? Mm -hmm. Zildjian cymbals, mm -hmm. and you play some old K Zildjians as well. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to John Riley about this, how the, uh, the, the drum sounds go through many iterations over the years, you know, where it's got to be power toms, and then years ago you had to have the bottom heads off, then the bottom heads on, then clear ambassadors, then power toms, then uh, nodal lugs, and all you know, all this stuff. But jazz players kind of knew what their sound was from the get-go. Is that because so much of that great music had already gone down and those things had already been decided? Possibly. You know, for myself, the years with Chuck Mangione, I did more experimenting along those lines with different heads. Mm -hmm. And I, I had uh, one of the first roto toms, if you remember that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. bit of thing that Remo used to make and and the way I was setting up and the way I was approaching the music could be considered a little more in the fusion uh, um, arena so uh, I was looking for some different sounds but 
when it came to returning to my roots, when I left Chuck and got back into playing in New York, I actually went full tilt backwards, man, because not only did I have, uh, with Bill Evans, not only did I have the drums you mentioned, the Gretsch and the, and the old case, but I had calfskin heads on my, on my drums. You know, on the batter I, side? On the batter side, all yeah. the way around. And, and I went full tilt, backed into that, you know, and then gradually worked my way uh, uh, back to, uh, to uh, I'm using Aquarian heads now. And that, that, that came to pass when I got out to uh, Los Angeles. But, you know, I was looking for a sound that I that I had in my head based on those records you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, we, grew, we grew up listening to that, that style and these great drummers with that sound. And that's the sound that I had in my head. And to, to me, it was no different than hearing the sound of, you know, a Steinway piano, you know, and wanting that or a Selmer Mark VI or whatever the state of the art instruments are. for Exactly. Us There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Where guys playing in different genres and experimental genres and different sounds and different tonal palettes, very well may need to look for those some of those other things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you teach at Cal Arts, right? You've been doing that for a long time. I do. I've been there twenty five years. Can't believe it. What is the uh, gist of your teaching? If I came to you as a twenty year old and I said, "Mold me," what what would be some of the things you would talk to me about? Well, the first thing that happens is I got I have to hear you play. So you're going to sit down and play for me, and and right away you teach. I'm sure. So any mm-hmm. teacher knows you can assess where the weak weaknesses are and where the strengths are. And so, um, in the course of a four year undergrad with me, uh, you're going to get all the material that everyone else is going to get, but you might get it in a different order because mm-hmm. you might have you might have strengths in terms of uh, repertoire or, or in terms of uh, you know, facility, but maybe your maybe your reading's not so good, and that was actually the the obstacle that I had when I got with Alan Dawson. Mm-hmm. He actually he, he tightened my reading up very quickly. So that's kind of how I approach it. And then the, I'm always we're listening. I have a, a recommended listening uh, list, and I have a I keep a, a playlist up on Spotify that, that I share with my students. I have. Uh, recommended tune lists so these are songs that i want them to learn and be able to improvise on and feel comfortable with and i'm always looking for ways to challenge uh a drummer's coordination i love i love john riley's books i love uh mm-hmm. four-way coordination i use that mm-hmm. um, you know I, there's a bunch of different things that we we work on but the end result has to be something you can apply in a musical manner. So, Musical is a key word. I was just going to ask you that. Uh, we can all look at technical exercises to we're blue in the face, but eventually we have to play musically. What does that mean mm-hmm. to play musically as a drummer or to play melodically as a drummer? What, what do people mean by that? It mostly means a lot of music, a lot of meeting great people and learning from the great artists. Kosa is fun, Kosa is hanging out, Kosa is meeting people, Kosa is playing together, Kosa is feeling the love. It's uh, amazing, it's my first time going. I've uh, just learned so much already. One of the uh, craziest, like, most wide open experiences I've ever had. I'm learning a lot. I'm already planning to come back. Well, it means being melodically driven. I tell my drummers when it, when we get around to the improvisation uh, lessons, well, first of all, what you're going to do is you're going to learn from some of the masters. You're going to check out Philly and Max and Roy and Shelley and you know uh, Tony, and you're going to hear how their melodic approach fits the music. But then along with that, I also insist that they listen to other instrumentalists. So I want them to be listening to Miles and Train and Cannonball and Donald Byrd and Bill Evans, you know, to listen to how someone on another instrument creates melodically with their instrument and how can we apply that to the drum set. Uh, and it, it is possible. That's a very good point. I realized uh, there are records I have where I've memorized, I didn't even know I'd done it, but I've memorized the solos. Uh, more than the drums sometimes you mm-hmm. know like like elvin's album uh, speak no evil i think i can sing every solo on that you know just because we want to be involved musically with it exactly right and so it, it will have an effect michael even if you're not aware of it if a mm-hmm. student is listening to this music it is going to have an effect now you can illustrate the point to them and maybe drive the point home by saying 
you need to build a little bit of breath into what you're doing because you don't need to actually breathe to produce your sound. You have to breathe just to stay alive, but you can play notes wall to wall. But now let's listen to what it sounds like when you put a little air in there and, and that, that really cool idea you just played has a minute or two or a second or two to resonate. And now you can go on from there. Mm -hmm. Now you have a very good point. You have your own band now too, right? You have a new release. Yes. Have had no. There's no new release. Honestly, I don't know if there's if there's a, a future for CDs, man. Don't well, don't uh, quote me on. <laughs> all right, okay. But I I heard I heard your quintet recently with with uh, Bill Cunliffe and 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 Shepard and Tom Warrington, Clay Jenkins. Yeah, uh, we've been together. We've been together for 22 years, and we've got four CDs out on Jazz Compass, which is a little label that uh, that I I'm involved in with Larry Kunst, uh, my brother John, and. Uh, uh, Clay Jenkins, Tom Warrington was part of that, but he's he's now moved to New Zealand, so he's out, of, he's off the scene, and so he's no longer available to play in the band. Right. But yeah, I've, I've had this band together for quite a while now. I love playing. This I band. love those recordings. It reminds me of of the Shelley Shelley's, you know, the famous recordings of Shelley with his quintet. Not that it's derivative of that, but that it's coming from that same sort of place, and and uh, just great stuff, man. I love that quintet. Thank you, Michael. You know, it's, of course, Shelley's band had an influence. Horace Silver's band had an influence. Miles' mm -hmm. band had an influence. All the bands that were coming up, you know, the, the standard quintet with trumpet and tenor was a sound that appealed to me. Uh, I had I had worked in a trio with Bill Evans. That, that worked well for him. You know, I played in Chuck Mangione's quartet. That worked well for him. Mm -hmm. this, when I decided to put my own band together, what happened was I came to Los Angeles and I heard Shep... And I said, oh, okay, I, I got to play with this guy, right, Bob Shepard. And then I heard Clay, I said, I got to play with this guy. And then I heard Conliffe and Warren. I said, that's it. You know, and you hear voices mm -hmm. and, you, and you say, well, that's the band I want to have. That's an important thing. Hamilton makes a point that not everybody is supposed to play together. You know, not everybody needs to work with everybody. You, you find the people who are have great simpatico with what you're doing. And, and it's uh, great music is made that way. Um, you mentioned the CD, uh, the industry changing so much. What, what's your take on that? I mean, let me throw out a few thoughts. One is it's great to be able to go on YouTube and catch everybody, right? I can go see guys that died long before I was born, all the way up to everybody. But nobody's getting paid on that. That's one of it. The other thing is there doesn't seem to be as much opportunity as there was before. And as an educator, you've got to deal with these kids coming out of college and... You know, what, what's your take on the whole scene that's, and how much it's changed? And are you optimistic or pessimistic? I mean, that's a lot of questions, but feel well, free. It, but, but you know what, Michael, it boils down to one, and that is, am I optimistic about the future of this music uh, mm -hmm. for my students? And I, I have to say yes. Good. And the reason, I'm, the reason I'm going to say yes is because this music is so strong uh, that it's, it's going to survive. It's everywhere now in the world. The, the the interest worldwide in jazz is incredible. More student, more young people want to learn it. More young people want to play it. To my way of thinking, if that much energy is being focused on something, there's no way it's gonna it's gonna not survive. Now, whether or not it survives in the same model that you and I came up in, you know, I don't think that's gonna be the case. But who knows? You know, there could be. There could be a, a huge resurgence in terms of uh, people going out to clubs. I just don't know the answer to that. But I think it's in pretty good shape right now. I mean, look at uh, you've got in New York alone, you've got Jazz at Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. Those guys are they're fully employed mm -hmm. year round. You've got the Carnegie Hall band. Uh, there's uh, there's that uh, the band in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, led by Byron Stripling. Right. You know, so those Clay, Clayton are, Hamilton. Clayton Hamilton, Hamilton on the Vanguard. West Coast. You've got right. uh, John Riley's gig at the Vanguard. You know that. Mm -hmm. I know it's once a yeah. week, but it's a steady working yeah. uh, big band. Right. And and I, I agree with you. That, who I don't know where it's going, but we still play Beethoven. You know, we mm -hmm. still play Mozart. Music will stand the test of time. Already has, so it ain't going away. Yeah, and the difference between Mozart and Beethoven and jazz is that jazz is always evolving into something new. You know, you listen to some of these young players today, and they're incredible, man. The music is amazing today, man. And my students are turning me on to people all the time. That's one reason why I kind of like Spotify as much as I, I mm -hmm. uh, 
I suppose uh, no one's making much money off of that. But the fact is, if I want to hear an artist right away, don't have time to get to the store. What store? Where do you go to buy it? you got to order it online. Exactly. I do the Apple Music thing, and the same reason. Yeah. I hear about a yeah. drummer, and let me hear this cat. And there are guys out there, gals too, that can do stuff with their feet I can't do with my hands. <laughs> you oh. know? The technique is just amazing. I was on the, Jeff and I were on the jazz cruise recently, and Rodney Holmes was playing with with uh, the Brecker Brothers reunion band, that guy's feet are definitely faster than my hands. I'm yeah. going to say that right now. I don't know how I can do that. <laughs> well, it's a younger generation throwing down some new stuff, you know. That's, oh, he's, you admire he's been it. around a while, man, but he can, man, he can play. Oh, my mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. What's next for you? Well, I'm going to Japan uh, in uh, next month for 10 days, and then in June I'm going over to Germany. I'm looking forward to that because my wife is going to be able to accompany me on that trip. And that's with a nice uh, quartet led by bassist Martin uh, Wind from New York with Scotty Robinson on everything you can imagine. I don't know if you're familiar with Scotty, but he no, plays no. every. When I say he plays every instrument, I mean he plays every instrument. The only limitations for this guy is what can I get on board the airplane, right? <laughs> and, and Bill Cunliffe on piano. And this oh, is going to be... A combination of uh, orchestra. There's an orchestra in uh, in Flensburg, Germany, that we worked with in the past. Some orchestra stuff and some quartet hits. So that's going to be fun. So you have everything going, man. I mean, you you travel. You, you have a gig where they they probably encourage you to travel, uh, to take gigs because you bring that back to the school as an artist. You have a, a long term sit down teaching university gig, mm -hmm. and you're freelancing in Los Angeles. Yes. Yeah, that's that is true, and you know, getting to that point about uh, allowing or encouraging your faculty to go away, you know, like I said, we just did the jazz cruise, and while we were in New Orleans, Herlin Riley came on with his band and just smoked it. Badass. And and we wa I watched this guy, and I've seen him do it before, but it finally it's finally registered. He's playing the tambourine in his right hand, and he's playing his, the drum set in his left hand, and playing. So I get back from that trip, and I got all my drummers working on that with the syncopation book, man. And it's like, you know, one of them used it the other night in a concert, and I thought, okay, there's the payoff right there, man. That's the, enlightened, that's the enlightened yeah. attitude. If you have great artists, they need to be out working, and they always mm -hmm. bring that back, and it's always better than if they hadn't done it. So, yeah. But, but uh, congratulations on all of that. You have a great career behind you and ahead of you, and, and everything's uh, cooking on all, firing on all cylinders, I would say. Thank you, Michael. I'm I'm grateful. Well, I appreciate your time, Joe. And uh, next time I'm in L.A., let's hang out. Come on over. I, sure I got will. two. I got plenty of drums, man. We'll set them up and we'll, <laughs> we'll go at it. All right, brother. Thank you so much for for doing this, and and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Michael. All right. Bye bye. <laughs> This is your host, Michael Vosbein, and I'd like to thank our friends at Sabian Symbols, Sound Synergies, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, and Drum Center of Portsmouth. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.